Hello and welcome to chapter 6 of Moving Forward, the show where we examine the TNT music industry, looking at the past and the present to forge a better future. I'm Robin Foster, or Foster as I'm sometimes known, and I host this show with DJ Mario Russell. Today we talk to Martin Raymond, affectionately known in the business as Mice. He's a musician, mastering and sound engineer, producer and music tech educator. Martin, welcome to Moving Forward. Hi, hi. Martin. All right. And you know, as usually in this show, uh, Mario has always opened the bowling. So go through Mario. Yeah, well, Martin, um, give us a little history about how long you started in the business, how long you're in the business. All right. And, this mm-hmm. this year will be my, I will celebrate 40 years as a professional musician come this September. So I, I started um, in the band Fireflight. Straight out of school at the age of about 17 years, so you could do the math there. And while in Fireflight as a musician, I started off as a guitarist, then became a keyboard player. And from there, I moved into like a recording studio. And um, if I keep prior to that, I had when, when I was in school, I was trying to get a job in a recording studio. And um, um, my, I started hanging around Semp Studios, which used to be on Macarapa Road. Uh, that's where I met Beaver Henderson, and as a result of which, uh, I got invited to join the band Fireflight. And from there, I got into more engineering production. And sometime in the 80s, I moved back to London. I'm originally from London. I'm a Trini by boat. Hmm. Boat, boat, uh, but, but you're talking plane. A banana boat. <laughs> A plane is something, you know, um, people who decided in the 60s when I was born, boat was the way to get to and from England. The, the ultra rich could afford to fly. So you you you, you are one of the Windrush generation? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say I'm sort of a descendant of, you know, not necessarily the Windrush, but that, that, it was that post-war uh, movement of Caribbean people to England, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother's Trinidadian and father's Jamaican. They kind of bounced up in England, and here I am. Uh, okay. I was fortunate to grow up in Trinidad. But in the 80s, I moved back to London, um, where I focused more on engineering and production. And, and then um, sometime in the 90s, I started hearing rumors of a uh, super studio that was built in Trinidad. And I came back for one month to check it out. And then I kept on going back and forth. One month, then two months, then three months. And mm-hmm. <laughs> you know the story from there. Then yeah, bongs up, we get married, and all of a sudden I know I was giving up my my apartment in London, and here I am. Okay. All right. So um, all right. So um, while you were in London, who who did you work with? Uh, I mean, um. I hate to name drop, but I've, I've worked with, um, uh, as I should have sent you in the bio beforehand, but um, no question, who did I work with where and when? Um, I, I, I work with a, a variety of different um, artists, both local and regional and international. Um, bear in mind, Trinidad is the only place where we use this word international. You know, when you're in London or France or US, you don't talk about international, you're saying. Um, and on the, I was on the, actually when I was in London, I actually had a chance to expand and work with, um, people like Merchant, um, that was really my first, the kind of soca, soca production kind of thing. But what, you remember um, what song that you did well, with Merchant? Uh, oh. as well as Brother Resistance. Okay. Um, Rest in uh, peace, Brother be, Resistance. It, um wow okay so um just a little side note um last week when they when resistance passed and they had all these things there there was a thing with resistance in a jazzy b video was that and people were arguing if it was really him it was really him martin yeah yeah you kind of freeze up there you you heard the question? Yeah, I just had to switch internet. No. Oh, she could repeat that. Oh yeah. Um yeah, no, no, no. I was saying that um 
Um, they were running a lot of things with Brother Resistance last week when he passed away. And mm. um, there was a shot of, of someone looking just like him. I, th I thought it was him in a Jazzy B video. Uh, mm. Do you know if it was really him? Can you say for sure? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the, yeah, that would have definitely that was definitely resistance. Um, so resistance was very much part of that whole scene and that whole circuit resistance, Jazzy B. Um, where resistance ran, uh, like all the uprising culture shop in Ladbroke Grove, and people like Jazzy B and whatnot would have been regular visitors there. Um, so there's always really a sound system. And um, I cannot even a Jamaican one of that. I believe Jazzy B might be from St. Lucia or somewhere like that. But they were, they were all kind of part of that collective scene and um, resistances or resistance and Netifer's shop was a real hangout place for a lot of the artists, musicians there. So um, um, definitely with that first set of breakout stuff with um, Soul to Soul, etc. I think resistance would have definitely been um, in, in that video. Yeah. Okay, well... Um... Not normal, not actually. And, yeah, but he was around that whole scene at the time. All right. So um, stick up in because we will get back into to Jazzy, right? Now, the thing about this show is this show is is we're trying to move the, the music business forward, but we want to look back at the past to see what mistakes we make or what victories we had and in order to forge it forward. Now. So um, you as a person, we found it important that you come on the show because you had that experience working with, with you know, that what we like in Trinidad, we like to call outside experience, you know, and um, mm. and like Mario, um, well, myself and Mario have this ongoing thing, like if, if the music, if like one of the failures of the music in the international space, is um is it because of the production of the music itself or is it a marketing and promotion thing right so i i would say i i used for well, much of my career actually i used to think it was a production and engineering thing and i know well, relatively recently know a lot better. It is really more of a marketing and and promotion aspect, the music business part of it. So, in other words, in terms of the the production and engineering aspect, once you have a budget, um, you can you can get that done. If you're not satisfied how it's being with how it's being done. That said, I was a growing up in Trinidad um, at a very early age. I think it's when I heard some of the first stuff from Last Supper. As well as one record, I always remember Stephen Ensign as Rock a Bye, My Baby Love. Um, I was around at the time of Lennox Gray's Around My Christmas Tree. That song had its genesis in our house in Diamond Vale. In fact, it's my mother who had sort of persuaded the artist Lennox Gray to record that particular song. Um, he used to play, come across by some plate every year, and that was my first baptism of I going to recording studio to hear that song recorded. So for a very early age, I realized there were people that knew how to make records and there were people that didn't. And I was never into what I call it kind of post-colonial kind of thing. That is something that those guys out there know that we don't. Because I had that experience of being around people and hearing the local records that were just incredible. So the meat was a matter of... Um, Black versus white, which was the underlying thing, or Trinidad versus this. I mean, there were people that knew and people that didn't. When I went to England, um, I very quickly, in a very short space of time, because right now we used to spend an enormous amount of time in studios here in Trinidad, or in bar rooms and listening sessions, wondering why did foreign records sound better than local records. It was almost like an accepted fact. Um, and in fact, the highest compliment someone could, play, could pay you was, hey, that song like a foreign record. So for <laughs> yeah, minutes, yeah, already yeah. banned Fireflight. Uh -huh, that was yeah. Fireflight's catch, that first record they did, which was done in Criteria Studios in Miami, in foreign. Full in enough. In like, the BG string section and the BG's engineer. It sounded like a foreign record. And uh, even to when we did um, up to Meet Me in Level 2, 
I was like, hey, we didn't know that was a up to this day. I played other people. I was like, that's a local record. So we still have that kind of mentality there about local versus versus um, versus foreign. In England, I very quickly realized that uh, because we used to speculate. I remember back then the internet wasn't invented as yet. Um, so all you hear, you hear that there was a special type of mixing board called a SSL that them fellas were using and that this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment. I mean, there was a point in time when you look in the early 80s, um, you couldn't compete with a Toto or Michael Jackson because they simply didn't have any money for the kind of equipment that they were using. You're talking about a, a Sinclair that costs half a million US or a fair light at 100,000. Um, like what Stevie Wonder was using on, um, back in his day as Yamaha Dream Machine or something like that. That was a 60,000 US right there. So there was always that kind of competitive thing. But when I got to England, I realized very, very quickly that, the, yes, there were some differences in equipment, but the number one difference was the amount of time spent in the studio on recording and mixing. Here in Trinidad, we tended to do things. So the time I left, we tended to do things in a hurry. It was typical that, hey, we have four of us in the studio, let me mix the album. Whereas that kind of approach was unheard of in England. It's like, okay, we mix in this song, take three days. And I realized that that was, that was the crucial difference, just the amount of time. It wasn't about the skill or um, anything like that. It was just, we just need to spend more time on it. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And, um, well... Mario, what about this? Um, uh, all right, we had we had this thing about um, remix. Yeah, but about, about remixing. Mario right. think that a lot of these. Uh, tell him now, Mario. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of these songs um, that we produce locally, <laughs> I feel if it remixed um, differently, oh. you know, you oh. see, you, if you're from London, you're familiar that there'll be a lot of tracks. Oh. That you might hear mm. one way and then it, then many DJs mm. would remix it over, but it would mm. make it more mm. accessible for different markets mm. or different dance floors mm. or whatever. Mm. So um, mm. I feel remixing have a lot to do with a lot of our music. Mm. Um, sometimes a lot of nice tones and rhythms get lost in the music. Mm. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. In fact, in terms of my earliest experience of a remix was, um, and you might remember this, um, Jackson's Shake Your Body Down to the Ground. Yeah. There was a version that certain DJs, I'm pretty sure Downtown Outlaws, either mm -hmm. Downtown Outlaws or Otty Meros was the guys to bring this version in. Thank there was a mix of it that had the percussion turned right up. Yeah. And it turned out that this was a UK mix that they had mixed it over for the UK market. And that was my first experience of, wait a minute, you could do that, you could actually just mix something differently for a different market kind of thing. And also spending time in London, I saw that more and more. One thing I had to, and once again, this actually comes back from working with Jazzy B and them, um, because they would do something in the studio, do a dub plate, try, test it out on, on the sound system in a dance. Um, in fact, we had even done that with um, Resistance stuff with Mother Earth and that particular album. We would test it out, and then if something not right, we would change the mix, go back in the studio, mix it over, etc. As a producer, um, I learned very quickly, particularly in England, not to not to be too precious about this thing called the final mix. And in today's market, some I tell my students, as a producer or engineer, always assume that somebody else is going to work on it. The version that you like, the version that you did in the studio, that is probably not going to be the version that becomes a hit. You have to learn to let go, not be too precious about this stuff, and just um, let it out. Yeah, different approaches, different mixes for different markets. So do you think, um, um, Cal Calypso, uh, right now, are huh? oh, you still talking? Go ahead, go ahead, finish. No, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, do you think Calypso right now has too much um, focus in it and there's a need for more rhythm? Um, for, for Well, I... What do you what think about Calypso, the arrangement? I mean, the songs are good, but you know, as, as an engineer, you would hear certain lovely things and these things get lost in the mix. 
And um, yeah. if we want to take it to an international market, for instance, not only the, the local Calypso market, I think we're doing fine on that mm. end, but to get across mm. to the foreign market, do you think um, the music is too tight, meaning too much vocals? Um, well, this is a battle I've, I've had <laughs> almost, almost entirely my mm. entire career. Um, mm. In that, I going to be a little diplomatic here. Um, I think the approach we take to, uh, not we take, I think the approach, the preferred approach to arranging Calypso and its derivatives mm -hmm. um, is unsuitable to the pop market. And that is probably too crowded, too many things happening. But we mm -hmm. have to like it that way here. And um, I agree that sometimes for a different market, we might need to take a different approach. But I think we've always been reluctant to do that. that we feel like you change anything, you're watering down the music, etc. Um, I have to say, and I've said this before, um, Trinidad is a highly, highly conservative music market, especially where Calypso and Soka are concerned. I've worked all over the world, and Trinidad is... Um, the only place I have worked where people go in the studio and there's an atmosphere of fear, not as much of creativity. Atmosphere of fear is like, boy, I can't do that. Boy, they're changing the thing. Nah, boy, um, them, um, them fellas wouldn't get that. Them DJs wouldn't like that. The amount of great ideas I've seen kill stone dead in studios simply because people were afraid to take the chance to try a different tone, a different drum beat, a different approach, um, etc. Which is... Um, uh, that's difficult for me to operate in that market, whereas in England, um, particularly working with rock, EDM, etc., there's always more a sense of adventure. It's like, hey, let's just try it. Let's let's see what happens. Um, there's never been, there's never this um, this thing of um, being afraid. Yeah, like we kind of lose you again there, boy, Martin. You kind of freeze up a bit. Now, even though I'm someone, mm -hmm. I personally do not make a distinction between Calypso and its derivatives. I acknowledge in a lot of people's minds locally, there's a difference between Calypso and soca music. So let me put it this way. So what we call traditional, Traditional Calypso. Right. I want mm -hmm. us to get My into that. You are the best explainer of that ah. I know. So get into it. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll say traditional Calypso. I won't get an explanation of what it mm -hmm. is, but I would say well, what we in Trinidad consider traditional Calypso, more like what you would hear in a tent or so. Mm -hmm. I think that stuff could benefit tremendously from a different approach. Um mm -hmm of recording, basically going back to live music, acoustic instruments, etc. Um, a, a lot of stuff in that style tends to their song cheap when it's done on drum machines and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and synthesizers. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's one. Um, the thing about it, I think most... A lot of people take that approach as more an effort to, to save money rather than to make it sound a particular way. But I think uh, more compared like with Latin, traditional world music, etc., a lot of that stuff could benefit from that, that sort of live approach. Um, in terms of what we call soca, which in my opinion is really just um, love we calypso. <laughs> and, mm. uh, you know, this is one of my pet peeves. You've raised an entire generation that thinks um, calypso is something slow and soca something fast. Uh, I really don't want to get into that right now. But I think the um, what we call soca, more the contemporary calypso, the indirect competition with um, EDM and dancehall and hip hop and trap, and they sort of need to recognize that um, in terms of the approach to mixing, in terms of the approach to. Um, arrangements. Uh, you're hearing a, you're hearing a little. You're hearing quite a so, bit. So, so I think um, this and stuff has you will you will understand what I'm trying to say because because of your London experience. Um, 
you feel if soca are taking, because they, you know we used to have faster soca songs, you feel they're taking a more club music approach rather than the dancehall hip hop type of approach. You think we'd have been able to go across to the London market more? Because yeah. it seemed that everybody went on that dancehall thing, you know, or tried yeah, to be similar. Is, uh, I would say at the end of the 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. uh, the thing is like the foundations for the modern kind of EDM explosion was really laid in London. London and Europe became mm -hmm. the center point of that house and techno music. Mm -hmm. um, because the U.S. was still reading under the kind of backlash to disco, it took like a full 10 years before, it's only early 2000s, dance music became a thing back in the U.S., mm -hmm. in terms of mainstream. And I remember when different groups would come across to England to tour, and I would tell them, hey, should we mix that for a house or mm -hmm. techno or this kind of thing? And people would laugh at me. I wouldn't call any names. It's like, what's that? What? Yeah, 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 yeah. What's house music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's techno? And at that point, I realized Trinidad was, they had no idea what of this whole scene that was happening here, maybe because at the time they were focusing, focusing on America. Um, one thing I would say, though, um, uh, trying to, once again, trying to be a diplomatic about this as well. No, nah, man, say it uh, raw. <laughs> no, people, people get cancelled too easily these days. Or oh, cancel the cancel um, culture with Trinidad already? Long time, long time. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, and uh, right now, uh, I don't think any of us can afford to be boycotted uh, or rinsed out on social media. Anyhow, um, you know, I like to be, I like to be diplomatic in any case. I think what we need to do in Trinidad is two things. Number one, focus on songwriting. Forget about genre. Forget whether it's soca, calypso, this that, this that. Focus on a good song is a good song. Study what good songs, what good songwriting is. Um, one thing I try to impress upon people, um, and something I've been thinking about a lot lately, the more this idea of local music being only soca music, and not respect to, to soca music, I would say only really came about in the 90s, late 80s, early yeah. 90s. Um, there was a definite shift, a definite focus. When you look at what was done before that, you have to remember that um, Trinidad um, was churning out pop songwriters, pop artists um, yeah. at an international level. Firefly, the Ocean, Taxi, all Kenna these guys, Hedy, you know. Um, Mark and Katie Kesun, mm -hmm. um, there's another guy in um, UK, I can't remember his name right now, uh, producers like Keith Diamond, etc., Tony Wilson with Hot Chocolate. The Bailey Brothers, etc. So Trinidad was, I had to send some stuff to my students every day to remind them, because somebody told one of them, but Trinidadians can't do pop music. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? You understand? Um, that's like saying, to me, someone telling me that is like saying um, Trinidadians can't play cricket, which is what they used to say at one point in time, or Trinidadians can't play foot football. Trinidad is a very unique place in that um, we have a wider variety of music out of any island in the Caribbean, including Cuba. Um, and I would say lately, some of that has been pushed into the background. No, 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 not lately. Uh, it has been pushed into the background from since the 2000 yeah. era. I mean, because yeah, you, you, you hear such wonderful music yeah. that people were making when yeah. you look back, mm -hmm. you know, even things like Ronda de Souza singing If You Ever Kiss and those kind of pop songs, you know, um, Robin with his, some of his music. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the thing is, what I'm saying, Trinidad as well had a competitive advantage. So they just, um, it's just like nobody's trying to do anything except soca. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not, it's not that they're not trying to do anything. Um, yeah. People are doing stuff. It's just maybe it seems that in media that um, because the other thing that has happened in since the late 90s to the early 2000s, well, already started in the 80s with the birth of the Big Fat and Firefly and Chandelier, Carnival really became a thing. This is, once again, this is something I try to explain to younger students so, and that they don't quite get that there was a point in time when you only had Carnival Fets the week before Carnival. That in the Carnival Tuesday, I think, was over the hill. But no, Wednesday was over. Tuesday was like some customs. Wednesday was over the hill. No, Wednesday was Wednesday customs. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. Thursday was tears. 
Tales. Right. Was Monday one. was any hours, I think. And, um, yeah, yeah, and you didn't have anything on Saturday because <laughs> you know the Clash with Panorama and Carnival Sunday was the only time I had like two fets. West India Club or over. And what happened as a result of the 80s is that whole fet season started to roll back until January. And created this whole thing um, where Carnival now became a thing in the early 2000s. With the advent, late 90s, early 2000s, was again thanks to people. A lot of people don't understand, but like someone like Marshall. What you're talking about is the era of the all inclusive. Yeah, no, even before the all inclusive, what happened was that they really started with David Rudder, um, and then Marshall Montano, when I was in a younger generation. Because when I was growing up, Calypso was my parents' music. You understand? That was, that was old people thing already. You understand? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember Mario. In a, in a party, you would play a calypso when it's time to bring out the pale out. Or, 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 <laughs> and then you play an Indian tune when yeah. you want to run, run everybody out of the fair. <laughs> you understand? That, yeah, that, that was how it was. So it's only by the, 90, I say by the 90s, and thanks to the efforts of David Rudder, most of all, I would say Shadow, um, then Marshall Montano, um, um, Kiskidi Caravan to some extent. Um, people like Nigel and Marvin, Roy Cape, a younger generation. Like that's one of the things you know, the younger generation soakers like their music as well, along along with uh, other things. That's a big difference from even when when I, I was growing up. But as a result of which, to me, and um, thanks to things like the soaker switch, is the idea as as much as people complain about it, um, the idea of five or six radio stations switching to only play calypso or soca music. From January, so so, like so what is what is Soka in your your interpretation of Soka? I mean, a rhythm. Um, mm. How would you interpret um, Soka? Because it seems to be very puzzling now. I mean, the beats all song it, similar. It, it's to dance all or to to, 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 um, to hip hop. Two things I would say: dance. I would say dance all is closer to Soka than it is to reggae. Number one, mm -hmm. I said I said that was a whole other story. Um, mm -hmm. Without getting too technical, um, a lot of what, basically what we're calling soca, is really um, up-tempo calypso with a soca beat. Uh, soca beat is that straight, that was a kind of a disco-derived kind of beat. Um, and this is actually very different from what my Maestro and Shorty and them were doing back in the day, where um, soca was a whole different concept. But, um, but in... in in, 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 the, in the essence, no. Um, I suppose Soka, Soka has a kind of a definite um, So my, my concern, what I've seen, and I realize that um, maybe I'm showing my age, and this is why I keep on coming back to this thing about songwriting. Um, what I'm seeing now, so let's leave the music side out of it. So there's a thing where we could consider a Soka beat, a specific type of drum beat, generally characterized by that kind of phony floor, um, maybe a little more up tempo synthesizers, those kind of things. So for on the floor uh, wasn't uh wasn't an influence of disco? Um that's a kind of chicken and the egg scenario in that yes it was attributed to disco. Um but as we know it's possible that the or the first big disco record after Van McCoy the Hustle, which is Hughes Corporation rock the boat. They might have gotten that idea from listening to Toby Tobias playing with, with Harry Belafonte. So it's a kinda it's a kinda who yeah, it's a kinda who um, um, who did it first. Um that's mentioned that's an area that we researched, but the four the four, yes. So the accepted wisdom is that's the influence of disco music in the yeah, well, in the seventies. So uh -huh. you can think of soca a soca beat as a modified disco beat. Mm -hmm. But essentially what people did was take all the road march, all the laugh away calypsos. There, there was a point there where calypso was up tempo. Like I was telling people the other day, when you watch, it's a shame that so much footage has been destroyed in Trinidad and we don't have access to footage. But Kitchener and a carnival Sunday night, you ever recall Kitchener doing anything slow? Hmm. Kitchener and a carnival Sunday night was, uh, the march car was pace, tempo down the line. And in fact, as Generally, it was whatever was the hottest, whoever win Calypso Monarch or uh, Calypso King, we used to call it. That was move on straight into road march. It was a like a natural natural progression. 
so what started happening with the Calypso era, the Soka era, was people that's, they kept on doing that, that up-tempo Calypso thing, that road march type Calypso, um, or it was so-called jump-up Calypso, but they just put a Soka beat behind it. Right, but so was that is the Calypso point. they say that the tourists couldn't dance to. Because it, um, they couldn't find the one and all them kinds of things, right? Yeah, so uh, the soccer beat made it easy to find the one. So what, get back to something, what the problem, the only issues I'm seeing now is that um, we see we raising a generation of artists that think a song isn't soca unless it's singing about party or whining. And that we've kind of lost that approach, to, a broad approach to um, topics kind of thing. And focusing on one particular area. Um, I'll put it this way, like when Sparrow started singing about wine, and he was one of the first guys to do it, that was like a really unique thing. When Marshall started to do it for a new generation, it was unique. But when every single song is about wine, and, um, I don't know, it's kind of, it, it starts to kind of lose lose some kind of shine. I mean, 20 years and, ago, and one, yeah. One, uh, <laughs> And if you're talking international, that's what I'm saying about the idea of songwriting. Because when you have a guy like Ed Sheeran, who sit down and study our Calypso and Soka, and basically take a topic, it's common to both Soka and Dancehall, which is I call good body girl, girl you're looking good, and write a worldwide number one smash with the shape of you. Mm-hmm. Now check it, it's the same topic, yeah? Girl, you're looking good. Your, your body looking good. But just check how just how, check how, how we approach that. The man, and, uh, uh, as I would say, in a approach worthy of shadow or maybe um, I'm a spoiler. The man, start off start the argument with hey, what a, um, a bar is probably not the best place to, to find. So let's talk. He's asking about why by being in a bar in a club. Is, is not the best place to think and you build a whole song um, around there. So I just, all I'm saying is I just feel our songwriters need to try a little harder. Um, it's very competitive outside here. Um, I'm not saying a song about whining car work in the national market. It's, it has to come really, really good, avoid cliches. You have to have a great, you have to have a great, a great melody kind of thing. Now, there seem to be um, many rhythms coming out. Sometimes for a season, might have over 200 rhythms, which gets very monotonous after a while because how could uh, possibly the radio play 200 different rhythms with three and four artists on a rhythm? You know? Um, what is What are your views on, on rhythms on the whole? Well, it seems that, you know, it's a quick thing. You know, you just jump in and you just add lyrics to a rhythm and... <laughs> Well, being one of the first people to do a rhythm in Trinidad, some mm-hmm. the pitch black rhythm, back in 98 or 99, um, I think it was, it was an okay idea then. I, I just think the rhythm thing has been really played out, in, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and hmm, a, couple, a couple of things with it. Um, I mean, it has some advantages. It makes sense from a production standpoint, etc. Um, but the one problem I'm having with rhythms is when you have too many similar songs on the same rhythm. In other words, if you're going to go with a rhythm, and it's really down to the producers, you really have to make sure that each song on that rhythm, or at least the top four or five songs, really stand out uh, radically different from each other, both thematically. So, sorry, do have a rhythm and have five songs about whining on the rhythm. And all of them with the same melody, everybody singing on the same note, da, 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 over and over, chanting, a girl whine, girl whine, jump up, etc. That That's one of the problems. That's why it's getting boring. In that you're not just having the idea of a rhythm, but you're having songs with similar concepts on the rhythm and similar melodies on, on the rhythm. You really, have to, you really have to work very hard. And even in um, in Jamaica, I think people need to recognize there have only been about four or five rhythms in Jamaica that have been hugely successful. Uh, and once over time, that can be considered classics. And those now are 
And to me, what made the difference with um, those was the quality of the songs and the rhythm. So when you think of, um, I forget what it's called, the rhythm with um, Greg Isaac's Rumors and J.C. Lodge, Telephone Love. Telephone Love was big. Um, mm-hmm. Just comparing those two songs um, on the rhythm, it's like two really quality songs that really stand up on their own. So all I'm saying, the rhythm thing to me is a little bit played out. Um, mm-hmm. But the... Uh, if you're doing it, to me, you have to do it. You have to do it. Um, I even think the Jamaicans to... have... Le- I haven't been hearing any of the Jamaicans doing too much rhythms right now. Mm-hmm. They have let it go. Mm-hmm. But the Suka market mm-hmm. seem to pick it up in a big way now, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it really is a bit played out. But um, all I'm saying... Yeah, all I'm saying, if they do it, to me, you really have to work a little harder on the quality of the songs or on the rhythm and the melodies. The other issue is because... Um, some rhythm, well, to naturally make um, a rhythm that you don't, generally you don't want to be doing too much um, musically on the rhythm to leave room for the song, for the songwriting. But in some cases, it's kind of forcing, to me, forcing people into a hole. Um, um, where, let's say, if it is use a simple chord progression, then people tend to write, write in a particular way. Um, one thing I would say. Um, I'm noticing a trend internationally in this time from the 2020s, very early in the 2020s. But I'm noticing a trend in both pop music as well as hip hop and trap music where people are moving away from the idea of just a simple repeating pattern. And there's a pop music going back into studying the 70s chord progressions, thing with change keys, more than three chords in a song. And even hip hop and trap, people are doing things like changing tempos, um, doing more melodic parts, breakdowns, etc. So, I think our songwriters, this, whether they're doing soca, dance, or whatnot, need to pay attention to where the um, to where the market is going um, internationally. And it's like, in other words, it's like, what is the what is the world standard kind of thing? Just like. Anyone who compete in the Olympics, they want to know who have the fastest time, who is running a particular way. You know? All right, so, but that's who you're competing against. Sorry, what's that? The the all right the the advent of what we call now the groovy soca. You think? Do you think that has more crossover potential? Potential? Because I kind of like it. Uh, I think we have we went back to melodies again, and you know we have songs with nice melodies and stuff. Yeah, we do, but unfortunately. Um, the the four biggest groovy soca songs of the last five, if not ten years, will, in my opinion, um, Farmer Nappy, um, Big People the, Party, um, Justin Bieber, Ed Sheeran, oh. Major Lazer, <laughs> um, especially um, Cold Water, was the other, I forget the other, um, the other. Um, other Justin Bieber and Major Laser, Major Laser one. Um, so yes, Goofy Soka was a really great idea. <laughs> Those fellas take it and, and, and run the route with it. Um, and even that style into the pop music, that was that's almost like kind of that was kind of passe. So um, there are possibilities of the Goofy Soka more in the kind of Afrobeat kind of style, which in, uh, in and of itself is a throwback to early, to kind of early soca, particularly, um, particularly groovy, particularly groovy soca. Um, but the, the, the one thing I find you talking about soca quite a bit, um, sure Mario can tell me, what's the biggest music in Trinidad right now? And what's the biggest Trinidadian music outside of Trinidad? The biggest music in Trinidad right now? Hmm. I mean, gen- generally, over the last few years, that also happens to be the biggest um, Trinidadian music outside of our borders. Um, but I mean, it's soca that is playing outside our borders, and I mean, that's what I see uh-huh. happening outside. Um, ah, so I'm, but I'm um, trying to understand uh, where you're coming wait, from. What, is it the is it what, is it those um? so-called soca-like things that come from the other islands? Uh, like the, the, den- the denary thing and, and the... And but the Afro rhythm, I, I saw Patrice did a song on the Afrobeat rhythm, which is really 
Cool. I mean, it's, she has a new song to come out. Let's come out. Let's just release actually on the Afrobeat rhythm. Is that what you're talking about, the Afrobeat rhythm? No, I'm, talk, I'm talking about Trini Bad, local dance hall. Oh. And, uh, the Zessa, Zessa uh, music? Zessa, yes. <clears throat> oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened, so all of those artists mm -hmm. um, are the ones getting millions of views on YouTube. Um, most of them for in, in access of even some of the soca artists. But I think what happened, we had this whole underground explosion and it kind of flew right under the radar. So it was only really about two or three, I was about three years ago when YouTube and Spotify started publishing country charts. Um, it's like people kind of woke up to the fact that they, they had a top 10 artist in Trinidad and you had a, there's a couple of soca artists inside of there, but um, there was a whole bunch at the time, bunch of people that I would say most people under 30 had never heard of most of these people. But yes, these guys were getting millions of views um, on YouTube, and they're very much driving the conversation outside because if they're kind of connecting to a, a diaspora, not just of second generation Trinidadians, but second and third generation West Indians, even in Jamaica, is resonating with a, a whole a whole bunch of, of youths. Um, but of course, it's also noticeable that this, as I just mentioned, Goofy Soka, that this music is generally very slow. Um, I would say it owes more to sort of hip hop and and dance hall, but the whole music is 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 changing. Um, in that, I would say this is the biggest thing out of Trinidad since Soka. Um, um, mm -hmm. Love it, love it or hate it, kind of thing. Um, the the um, one of the challenges, though, um, is, I say it's because it's existing, is, to me it's also a generation gap thing. And um, let me put it this way, is, um, you know, when it really hit me, um, Soka Monarch 2020, or last carnival, um, mm -hmm. two things struck me at, at that show. Um, I could count on one hand the number of people under the age of 50 in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Eh? I could really count on one hand the number of people under 50 in on that one crowd. Hand. Under I was 50. kind of thinking to myself, has, um, has Soka become like a, an old people's <laughs> thing? <laughs> uh, the majority of the crowd, I would say, was uh, maybe 5,000 to 8,000 people, um, very small for Soka Monarch standards was between, I would say, um, maybe 50, maybe one or two late 40s, to about 60. Mm -hmm. The highlight of the night was the Trinidad Dance Hall segment, very controversial when um, the organizers decided to include this, this uh, local dance hall segment. What struck me as well was that all the people in that crowd of 50-something-year-olds knew all the words. Right, which was uh, which was a bit unexpected for me. So all I'm saying is, I think there's a there's a whole shift change taking a generational shift. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think you're right. And, <laughs> yeah, mm. I think it's gonna. And, um, it's, 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 it always starts on the ground first, eh? and then it it penetrates on. In within maybe five six years, it starts to come more and more. I hope the guys on them keep up their their underground song of of this Zessa music. Because it, it yeah, could we, go far and uh, it could take soca to another level, or, or if you want to call it soca. But yeah, I, I would say I would say two. There be two issues with that. Um, I think the idea of soca appealing to a uh, older crowd. To me, the one of the first people to actually recognize this was Farmer Nappy. Actually, I remember uh -huh. uh, this was maybe about ten years ago, mm -hmm. where uh, let's say he was mastering something by me, and he said, "Hey, what?" he is going to start targeting his music towards a more mature crowd. He's not going to fight up with the young boy, the power soca, with the wireless thing. The big he people party. This. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is 10 years before big people party. Okay. But you understand, about 8 to 10 years before big people party. But I was the, con the concept was there already, that I want to target a more mature audience. And I was telling him, what, yeah, what's wrong with you? you know, you're trying to make yourself old before you time to me. This music is a young people music. But he was right. There was a market there for the kind of older, mature, the groovy soca, um, different kind of thing. And he really started a course, started a course with it. Um, 
one thing I will say though, there's some interesting stuff coming out. Um, when they hear like some of the very young artists, like voice to some extent, Aaron Duncan to another extent, that is incorporating uh, so real hardcore soca calypso along with some of that kind of Zessa kind of vibe. So I think there's some interesting interesting stuff coming out. The the one issue, uh, one of the um, one of the issues I have with the with the Zessa thing, of course, is the lyrical content. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to be torn between two opposing poles. On the one hand, it is, um, I see it as a direct descendant of Robert Talk, is straight up Kaiso, whether those guys recognize they're doing Kaiso or not. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd put together, I'd put together uh, on some Facebook argument a few years ago, I put together, there's a, a bunch of lyrics and ask people to guess if it was Midnight Robber speeches, Calypso, or Zess. And <laughs> most people couldn't tell the difference with the stuff taken out, taken, taken out, out, of, out of context kind of thing. So on the one hand, I, I see it as part of an oral tradition. On the other hand, um, I personally have uh, a, um, uh, uh, I have an issue where my situation in Trinidad with how much times I want to sing about shooting um, somebody else. Uh, who skull born, who marrow fly, and... Well, remember, it, it appealed to a certain audience. It, it has to start ghetto. And then it will work its mm. way up and refine itself as it go along. But that's how it is start. No, <laughs> no well, well the, the thing about it is that is what is working o- already in that. Yeah. Uh, there's a kind of a... What was the word, boy? Uh, there's a reason why um, the biggest audience for hip-hop is... Essentially, white Americans, uh, particularly middle, white middle class, college educated Americans. That's who's buying most of the hip hop and gangster rap. Is like living through that that sort of that sort of um, that sort of experience. And um, you're seeing you seeing the same a same sort of thing. Um, but once again, all I will say, it still comes down to songwriting. There are some incredible artists in in the genre. Some good writing. Unfortunately, um, we already lost two of. Uh, Probably the strongest artist within that genre, um, which is K Lion and Rebel Six, kind of thing. Um, incredible writers through a couple of different circumstances. Um, the, but what I would encourage persons doing that, doing that um, music, do is once it comes on to the, to the writing, as I always tell people, um, if you want to do a gunman song, Go and listen to Ice Cube. Today was a good day, mm-hmm. which is number one, a brilliant piece of social commentary, one of the best yeah. pieces of social mm-hmm. commentary ever done. And at the score is really a really a gunman song. Is he saying that today I didn't have to use my AK mm-hmm. because it was a good day? But so if, if it, yeah, it, if you remember your experience in the music, right? You could remember any song mm-hmm. particular that you you probably did. That was a massive hit, but never played on the radio. And this is what this Zessa music is about. It's not playing, but it's on the ground and it's penetrating. You know? Well, it's very much to be, I see the exact same parallel of what took place in England mm-hmm. um, in the mid-80s. So I went to England in the mid-80s. And the whole, that whole dance, hip-hop, um, jungle, drum and bass, mm-hmm. dance music was just existing below the radar. It was an underground thing. BBC Radio 1 was just playing rock. I remember, mm-hmm. to give an idea how it was, even people like Stockake and Waterman, as the guys behind Rick Astley and Kylie Minogue, to get that music to break, they used to go wrong to all primary schools and things with a boombox and playing the song. And, and, and it was only when, you see, but it was in, a similar thing, it's kind of driven my music business. It's only a day when um, BBC on the charts, they they say when the music charts for that week came out, and I think it was either Jason Donovan or Rick Astley was in top ten debut at number five with a song nobody had ever heard before, but all the kids knew it. They had to start playing dance music, and a similar thing started happening with um with a lot of hip hop, techno, even same same thing with um with Soul to Soul. Soul to Soul wasn't playing on the radio, 
that that broke from pirate radio that was underground mm. right through and through and it's the same thing the bbc is like hey guess what we have a new debut in top 10 we've never heard this record before mm. some people call it soul to soul but but the the underground in london birmingham nottingham everybody knew his song well, um, is the same so thing is the same thing happening now with that's just some music i mean the adults don't know anything about it they don't like it but you find all those teenagers that 20 years old group they know everything about it and you, you know the radio can't play it and and they love it more and everybody know the songs <laughs> right so well it, it, to some extent I, i would say that's a good thing because once again it's what my always kind of tell me but i mean in the business so you know that's how it is start <laughs> Not as that, but uh, like for about the last 10 years, I've been telling some of my students, because I've been expecting something like this, that when you know you really have something, it's quite, a lot of students talk about it, they want to create a new genre of music, they want to do a new genre of music, and I say, it's not just about doing a new genre of music, and maybe this is one of the issues with Soka, by the way, it's not just about the music. When you have a new style of music, with a new way of dressing, a new hairstyle, mm-hmm. And a new dance. When you have those four things in combination, then you might start to have something. And that's why I started seeing with the whole, with the whole Zesta thing. It wasn't just about the music, but it's about dressing a certain way. Um, there was even that first big breakout song, uh, more um, uh, more Zesta, was uh, had a dance yeah. to go with it. Um, the use of a bit, like kind of kind of hairstyle. So it's when, to me, it's when you have that combination of factors that, that things could really things could really start to start to move forward, and um, and I think perhaps disco, not disco, soca. One of the issues with soca is in terms of its imaging or its marketing. If you look at a soca album cover from the 70s, um, you could not tell the difference between that and a disco record. I mean, the way Sparrow, Arrow, Shorty. Nelson, everybody was dressing in the kind of jumpsuit, the same kind of hairstyles. It was it was a look that was indistinguishable from American R&B. Whereas when you think about reggae, reggae had a distinctive look in terms of body, mode of dress, the hairstyle. So all of those things for me are, are a factor. But yeah, well, they, did, they didn't have an oil boom. That is what I just put it down to. <laughs> Because, yeah, well, you know... Um, well, Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, Trinidad in the 60s, we used to wear, well, normal people, working class kind of Belmont people. And then, like, we used to wear tailor-made pants. Of course, it had a lot of tailors in the, in the, in the community and thing, and you, you buy a pants yeah. length and you carry it. And then uh, when we started to get affluent and thing with the oil money, we started to buy clothes, buy ready-made clothes. Now. And then when I went to Jamaica... Back in 1982, I saw everybody was still kind of on the tailor-made kind of thing. So I said, wow, you know, what, what is the, you know, how come they still, they look like how Trinidadians used to dress like in the, in the 60s and very early 70s, you know. And in the 80s, yeah. you know, Jamaica, and I realized it was that. It was, it was people still was sewing clothes and thing. <laughs> you know, yeah, instead of just buying yeah, something off of a rack. We're looking at, and, and, and the truth of a weird kind of like, I remember in the 90s, when I came back to Trinidad in the 90s, I uh, started seeing new artists coming across to London. I felt it was a mistake because like, nearly all these soccer artists were going with these short dreadlocks. And mm. I personally, no offense to anyone's choice of hairstyle, but I personally felt that was a mistake because now you became indistinguishable from Jamaican artists. Um, and interestingly enough, um, we already reached a stage where um, dreadlocks went out of style And now coming back in style with the whole trap, that whole trap hip hop um, underground movement, you know, short dreadlocks, multicolored dreadlocks. So I don't know it's, it's just just one of those things. One of the things I believe though is um, uh, Trinidad. We are very unique places. I'm more and more I'm starting to understand how unique Trinidad is in terms of, and um, it really is a natural resource in terms of the talent we have here. We We say that we have too much talent, um, but it is actually true. Um, we have more, um, as Kim Johnson said in one of his books, we have more orchestras than the whole of London. Uh, when, they count, when they count all the steel bands, by a serious factor, we have more people involved in music um, per capita than practically anywhere else on earth. 
And I think we have a, a skill and a talent in songwriting, no matter what the genre. I always tell people, to my mind, it is not a coincidence that the two hottest female rappers in the game right now are of Trinidadian descent, which is Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. Um, I don't think that's I don't think that's a that's a coincidence. That's a coincidence at all. Uh, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is the difference with them and practically every other American female rapper? Was that secret sauce? And as we like to say, is the oil in the coil kind of thing? Um, to be similar to what made uh, um, Rihanna from Barbados um, an international superstar. The the very thing uh, that we might find annoying, why I call that yeah yeah that kind of nasal Caribbean kind of voice. That is what made her stand out stand out in that in that crowd, in that market. So I just think we need to play to our strengths, um, regardless of the style of music. I, the only thing I try to encourage people from Trinidad, no matter what music you're doing, just be aware it's very, very competitive outside there. And if you're coming here, come good. You know my philosophy. I, don't, I personally don't feel it's great if you could do soca, calypso, because we have our own thing, or rap so, or anything like that. But if you want to be a rock band from Trinidad, you just have to make sure you're 10 times better than the rest of them. You understand? You want to be a hip-hop artist from Trinidad? You, you, know, you, have, you have to come good. But the, and the advantage you have is you can always, anytime they give you trouble, you can just dip in your back pocket and pull out a little Calypso twang, a little Trinidad thing, and, 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 and match them up with that. So I think we have some competitive advantages, and we just we really need to play to our, to our strengths kind of thing. All right. So where's the way forward now? How... How we break in that international market or scene? <laughs> right. Um, two things very briefly. One of the things, which is actually why I have to run off and deal with right now, um, we're trying to get more people involved in things like the Grammy Awards, um, Billboard Awards, etc. We had to be, it's like, it's like being on the Olympic Committee, you understand? It's like being in, in World Cup in part of FIFA. So we have to take part in these international organizations, international award shows, um, et cetera. Um, we have to look at music as a business um, in terms of making sure your stuff is released for sale or streaming. Um, so it's not just about having a, as a short Mario, you would know there's a big difference between a, a big rec, a big tune and a big record. Mm-hmm. And I would say one of the things, we have plenty big tunes in Trinidad but correct me if I'm wrong, the last big record we had was Chris Garcia, Chutney Bacchanal. You follow what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. In terms of international. Talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah, I thought about even, even at a national level. That was the last big record. To my so what about, Gan- what about Ganja Farmer? <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I would say that's in terms of presence, maybe the international presence, but by the time Ganja Pharma came out, the sales market had kind of evaporated, but it was a good example of what could happen with the, with the, with the underground. So the other thing is, um, I've been trying to encourage um, this briefly, with this pandemic I think we had, and probably still have, because unfortunately I think we're going to be in this for a while, a golden opportunity to go back more into the recording business of selling and streaming music because since about, I would say, maybe last 20 years, early 2000s, maybe 2005 or so, when the, the record business collapsed in Trinidad, we've put all, uh, as an industry, we've put all our eggs in the basket of live performance. Mm-hmm. And that was great. Um, but as this pandemic showed, uh, well, that could evaporate with one cough on sneeze. Well, yeah, that is what it is. I mean, what the reason why, you be, as we were saying earlier, why a lot of people gravitate to soca because it's the only music you can make money from in Trinidad. Because yeah. because you, um, what we're doing is we are servicing our carnival and the Trini type carnivals of the world. Right? And some people have yeah. become um, rich and thing, and then with the internet now. Um, I understand a lot of these young producers doing well off of Spotify and thing and making yeah. money and things. So, you know, power to them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, the, so, the, so, I think, so I think we saw see a move back towards that, uh, recording music and the power of a recorded 
piece of work as opposed to a live performance, whether it's for sale or for streaming. But one thing I like to encourage people, I think there are about 40 million people in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, I forget what the total figure of people in the, in the, that's in the Caribbean. Um, was it like 40-something million in the Caribbean, or 6 million is English-speaking? Uh, the figures are out there somewhere. Um, you have to kind of connect with your markets. As I say, um, there have emerging markets in China, in Africa, in the Middle East, etc. Uh, so my, I, I see a lot of music makers in Trinidad. Particularly, there's a couple of people I know on doing some incredible work on the and like EDM and dance music and stuff, um, as well as even kind of alternative music, obscure music. And I keep on seeing them getting themselves frustrated because like the music not played in Trinidad and nobody taking them on and this kind of thing. I keep on saying um, you need to find your market. There are 7 billion people in the world. Somebody somewhere will like what you're doing. Um, not everything is is for this market. It is great if you could build something in your hometown, find more power to you. Um, but generally, as I said, that normally means doing uh, more soccer than anything else. Um, um, I think it's better to, it might be better to um, just find find your market, and because the internet has kind of blown that apart, it takes a, it takes a little bit of work, but you can find your audience. As I always give the example of the um, K-pop group BTS, that's now the biggest group in the world. Yeah, um, because, all right, but you mm-hmm. see, uh, Korea. Yeah, no, hold on, hold on. Mm-hmm. Now, hold on, hold on. Part of the reason, the reason I give them that example is because they were never big in Korea. They used to get real fight down because they were a small label. So um, they, they used to get fight on, they used to get airplay. Every time they want to interview some radio DJs insulting them, all kind of thing. So they say, hey, what happened? They started to build a fan base outside of Korea. And then they went to the States. They spent some time in the States. And they were really the first group to really use social media to build this army outside of Korea. Now, of course, they're like kings in Korea now. But, um, but there was a point in time where in Korea, like them, all right, so how they build that base? When you say they build a base, how does one go about building a base? Um, through the power of the internet, um, reaching out to people. One thing that they did, um, which is something that um, Taylor Swift did, and she did the same thing. That's another thing people need to recognize. The modern artists, all the top artists who are the top of the game now, are ones that build genuine fan bases and then made it on the strength of that genuine fan base. I always give the example of Taylor Swift. Because you might used to watch a clip. So at 15 years old, she sat down and realized all them country songs is being written by a bunch of 35 year old men, and all they're singing about is drinking, driving in a pickup truck, and with, with the girl with the cut off shorts and the long blonde hair hanging onto the back of the pickup yeah. truck while they're drinking. And she realized, hey, as a 15 year old girl, I don't want to hear that. None of my friends want to hear that either. Let me write music for my friends. So she started to build that that base so you really have to have a genuine fan engagement you have to reach out to people um bts's secret is simple they just took the decision to film everything and put everything on the internet they haven't i saw i remember last year during the pandemic them fellas stream a band meeting they had a band meeting that's discussing hey, yeah what we're going to do for the next album for about three hours straight on the internet millions of people watching i'm like wait a minute you know, we could have run back in the day I mean, literally. Back yeah, back. but you had to have a base for the millions of people to watch it. So, so I'm telling you, tell that's how they got the base, by doing stuff like that. By just realizing people want content, people want to get involved with the, um, with the artist. So anything, they're brushing their teeth. Here's what I had for breakfast this morning. Here's the fellas hanging out. Um, and that's the same strategy. A lot of those young up-and-coming artists is the generation where they, they have a phone in their hand all the time. They film everything. And put everything up um, um, up on the internet. So it's about engaging with your fans, not just when you have a record, a record, to, a record to promote. Um, I remember Taylor Swift's former manager I had a chance to speak with him, and he said her strategy was simple: um, let me make friends, and then find out what music my friends want and make music for them, which was the opposite of the record company approach. Let us make a record and find who will like this record and try and sell it to them. Um, so, yeah, I think we have tremendous tools in terms of the internet, um, social media, etc. 
Um, you just have to make use of it and 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 essentially study study these strategies going seeing a new generation of artists. In fact, it, it started more in the early 2000s with um, some people like Jonas Brothers and stuff like that. But yeah, and this is even making it actually this is what record labels want to see: how many followers do you have, how many fans, um, um, how yeah, how many views. So, so all I'm saying is yeah. make use of, of of what is out there. So so the old so so nowadays you know I I notice a lot of artists would produce a, a record for instance and they they have no budget for promotion or they have no idea for promotion and then they would come and blame a radio station and say the radio ain't playing the song because they give the song to the radio and we have plenty of radios now we have the internet right mm. but they, 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 they seem to have no knowledge that the song is good as promotion do you agree with that and, and, and your ability yes, to yes. promote? Um, promotion mm -hmm. is key, a uh, standard thing in this business. You need to have your promotion budget should be four times your production budget. Uh -huh. Okay, wow. <laughs> to make a record, mm -hmm. be prepared to spend that in promotion. Um, I tell people music is no different from any other product. If you bring out a new sweet drink in Trinidad, a new brand of roti, Mm -hmm. You're not just gonna put it in the stores and hope for the best. So you do you tell do you tell the artists support. that come to you these things? Because I mean, <laughs> yes, I, I tell them that. But the the issue with that though is um, this is uh, kind of stick it by the end, Trinidad is that is where record companies, that's where investment comes in comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have people willing to put up the money because it costs money and artists don't necessarily have that kind of money. Um, a similar thing happened in England about 15 years ago where the government did some research and they discovered that the music industry has really been driven by small to medium record companies, not the big labels. The real growth was in these small to medium enterprises and all of them had major trouble attracting finance. If you go to a bank, they wouldn't be able to get finance. So the UK government actually set up a system um, to attract like venture capital, to make it more attractive to invest in these companies. And as a result of that, that is how we end up with Adele, Sam Smith, Amy Winehouse. There's a whole generation of UK artists that benefited from that approach. So um, through music TTS and the government agencies, we try to work on something like that, but it it requires a kind of a culture change from the business community in Trinidad. Um, people really need to see music as a business, as as a product, and not as a charity or as a as a handout. Uh huh. Um, I, feel, uh, I, I, I really have to go. All right. right. Well, boy. Um. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah, we Maybe we could do a, a a Martin Raymond part two because I feel we now start to scratch the surface. Quickly, I think we'll have a carnival this year. What do you think? Um. That's my question. People are being asking. Not officially. Um, in that, if we have anything at all, which I think is increasingly unlikely, um, I think it'll be very small scale. Nothing, oh, nothing official. Maybe a few fets or so. I think all the major bands, because they need a whole year to prepare, they are already thinking about Carnival 20, 2023. Um, un unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I will say one thing with that in, in closing. I was I happened to be downtown. I've been downtown for quite a while on Friday, and I was observing some of the taxi stands. And I have to say, a large number of people with a mask on the chin talking at the top of their voice, and from uh, hanging in, and then hanging in groups talking at the top of their voice. And when I see that, I say, "Hey, what? We are not getting out of this." Um, um, mm. Um, in a, um, in a hurry. And especially if the if the if the if the, if the Delta variant reach, we could be in some trouble. Yeah, we. we. Um, um, anyhow, <laughs> no comment. All right. More case no. of when. More case of when. Well, okay, boy. Well, Martin. Yeah. I know. Um, well, thanks for talking to us. I mean, you clarify a lot of things, you know, and um, I maybe I think coming up. Um, depending on how it go, maybe we should do a Martin Mice Raymond 2 part 2. All right, okay, All great. Right. So, well, let's, let's, well, let's review this and think of any further questions, you know. All right, I already have to go there. Well, okay. no, we would get questions when we put it up on, on YouTube, people would give feedback now, so we could always uh, uh, actually. If, 
if you have any any further questions after, uh, I I always have questions, you know. I could <laughs> I could be your question until until midnight tonight. But no, I, have... no, no, I mean not I don't know. I mean once you once you once you review it kind of thing. Hey boy, what you 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 exposing your cat, boy. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. That was that was something that was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, uh, All nice right. Nice talking Martin. to you, Martin. Um, okay. Thanks a lot, boy, Martin. Yeah. You like me a few things. Right. So, boy, Mario, boy. Yeah. Not a good show. Yes. All right. So yeah, man. So that was moving forward, and um, we will be with you next week. All right. Bye for now.